Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled 1001 Windmills of the Mind. A collection of quotes taken from what's often called the psychodynamic or the psychoanalytic perspective, which long ago, as I understand it, was referred to by some as philosophical medicine or narrative medicine, helping one to be their own story doctor. This is part two of two. Uh, I just completed part one. And uh, due to a tech issue, I'm going to continue here in part two. I was just uh, in the middle of the video and um, yeah, my, my laptop froze on me. So I'm just gonna continue here in part two. This song here um, by uh, the singer Zaz, uh, she, uh, one of the lines in there, according to the English translation is, is um, seems to me sort of a reference to our topic here on trauma. Uh, she asks the question, are you going to love life or just let it pass by? So that's the theory. In trauma, we might be disassociated a little bit, go through the motions of life, and feel like life is just passing by. And her imagery was, um, you know, somebody's on a subway, on the platform, the train passes by. Or another one was, um, you know, she misses some guy or something and waited for him or something, and then he passed by, didn't even notice her. So she feels like life is just kind of passing her by kind of thing. That, that's maybe like the imagery of trauma where we feel uh, going through the motions of life, sleepwalking through life. When does life begin? Feeling that life is on hold, life's not supposed to be dress rehearsal, feeling unreal, feeling numb, these, these kinds of things. Um, so that's sort of a common midlife question that something's missing. So we look back at the theory of trauma. When the baby's traumatized, his, his, uh, his aliveness, his vitality, his golden ball gets pressed down into the non-reporting brain. One guy calls it, it gets put into cold storage, it's frozen. 
uh, and, the child, and then do the simple, basic, classical conditioning. He's going to be afraid of his feelings. So he'll go through life, uh, going through the emotions of life, but not enjoying the present. Hence the quote from the Greenberg film, Shrink said to the guy, you have trouble living in the present. So you're dwelling in the past because you never really lived it. Child can't know it, child can't perceive it, it's too much excitation, hence the freezing effect. So the image is, uh, as mentioned in part one, scarecrow, uh, uh, tin man, cowardly lion. And um, so that's like a fragmentation where we don't know the loss of the feelings, the tin man feeling empty or you know, emptied like that, and cold, steely, I guess, kind of. Um, and we don't even know the scarecrow, this frazzled character. Okay, so that means we don't know, um, we can't make the link and they're separated, right? And uh, because we don't know why we lost the feelings, the person, uh, the imagery, uh, that psychic mind for the person means the person's gonna feel kind of disconnected, disembodied, so to speak. If I feel therefore I am. So that's the cowardly line. Um, so we gotta be like Dorothy, or, or basically Dorothy's like the part of the mind that's trying to heal things. So yes, Dorothy has to like find the scarecrow and the Tin Man and the lion and kind of line things up again. That's sort of like an image of this innate drive for healing, to know the trauma, have the have ne have narrative medicine, that kind of thing. So we sort of started this uh, in part one. Um, and um, so I was talking in part one, I was talking a little bit about uh, Margaret Muller's theory about development how the child has certain needs from the first uh, from birth to three roughly sub roughly subdivided into two sort of three sort of phases okay his egg needs his uh, superman needs and uh, his uh, explore now voyager needs let's call it that let's keep it simple like that right so the baby needs the paradise to continue that's like a psychological egg where the paradise he felt in the uterus continues in the first four to five months so let's call it the paradise needs for the first four to five months now he still thinks he's so narcissistic, right? The grandiosity is still there. He's got motor skills, so that's the Superman phase. Invincible, can do what he wants. The world, he, he thinks the world is his. And, um, and then at 18 months, a developmental accomplishment, okay, meaning uh, that narcissism kind of dissipates, and now he's in the, in the more curious area of recognizing that people are people. He's a person, he has feelings in his own right. Others have feelings in their own right. He's got to learn about relationships and people. That's the, the explorer phase. Whereas prior to 18 months, he didn't care about others as people. He just thought the whole world was his and everything was for him, everything serves and that kind of thing. Huh? That's, a, that's a key developmental transition, roughly 18 months. But the child needs to egg first. He needs the first four to five months to go through the four to five months to 18 months okay, to get to the 18 months to 36 months. So we talked a little bit about those sort of three kind of faces there before the video, uh, before I accidentally uh, shut off. Uh. Yeah, what happened was I uh, tried, to, I had to reboot the computer, but in the process of rebo re rebooting it, somehow the camera shut off. So I just lunged into here, the part two. And uh, we're playing this song here in relation to our topic for today's video, um, which is a symptom of trauma. One of the symptoms of trauma that uh, we haven't really kind of focused too much yet on. But let's see if we can start in on it with this video. Something called, let me get it up here. Something called trance logic. So we don't, uh, so this is sort of a new, a new uh, idea here. So let's see how we do trance logic. It's sort of a symptom of trauma Trans logic, as if you were trying to understand the logic of a dream. So if there's trauma, uh, in the beginning the child's self-concept is blurred in with the other concept. Right? So if there's trauma there and, there's a comp and the child didn't separate, individuate, so I'm okay, you're okay, he's still stuck in that place didn't get his symbiotic needs met, or he didn't get his grandiose needs met, or he didn't get his now voyager needs met. Um, a lot of this trans logic uh, is the dream world called primary process mentation. So today's topic is, is on this jargon called trans logic. I think I'm going to link it in with our thread on disassociation uh, plus 
to our thread on primary process mentation plus to our thread on trauma. So this topic, uh, uh, it's going to link to our, uh, three of our chapters, right? So as mentioned in part one, we have 58 chapters here to 1001, the news of the mind. One of them is on trauma, one of them is on primary process mentation, and then another on disassociation, uh, mainly by Philip Bromberg and Elizabeth Howell. So this topic here called translogic, I think it's going to link into those three uh, threads there. So up until this point, I, I've mainly been using a double think. Uh, so another symptom of trauma is all this double think. Okay. So trans logic seems to be sort of si similar to this area. It's any kind of irrational, confusing uh, things people are saying. They they believe something irrational, uh, and they believe something that's reasonable simultaneously and not notice the difference, kind of thing. It's like a person with a bully pattern, for example. Okay. Uh, so the bully personality pattern may manifest if the baby doesn't get the paradise of the mother, the oneness of the mother, the sweetness and the oneness of the mother, and he's enraged because he never got that. So he's always scaring lackeys to be symbolic breasts, get, to get a reaction from others thinking the mother's there responding to him. Uh, so the uh, person with the bully pattern is considered prematurely ejected out of the mother infant dual unity that all babies begin with in the beginning. Okay, all babies are one with the mother, but in the first four to five months that has to continue. If it doesn't continue, what are the personality patterns that may spring forth during that phase, according to, again, according to theory? Okay, okay, in part one, all my disclaimers uh, was put in part one, right? Um, is that um, the one it could be the Iago pattern, bully pattern, narcissistic pattern, nor functioning BPD pattern, and maybe some of the more disturbed kind of patterns, right? Um, so for example, the bully pattern, if they're victimized by the mother, they identify with the aggressor. Uh, in later life, that's a, so that's a frozen a memory. Mother shamed them, didn't give them the paradise. They identify with the mother that caused that. Okay, we create a record. When there's trauma, we create like a stencil, a mental template. It's like a record on a vinyl disc record. In every new situation, we play that record. We recreate and relive that record because we think emotionally we're still in the past crying for love. Mother, I need paradise with you. Mother said no. Okay, so he, he becomes the no mother, uh, rejecting him. Okay, so when he plays it in the present, he'll reject others. Okay, others will stand in for him as a child. He'll be the aggressive mother, replaying the record of how the mother's rejected him. So if the mother rejects the baby or shames the baby, there's a, there's a template on there, mother shamed the baby. Okay. That's a pain, that's a trauma. When there's trauma, we repeat with the fantasy that when we repeat it or recreate it, relive it in the present, we think we're still in the past, hoping to get the love that we needed, right? Because we're still in the past, as if the, the baby's still crying with the mother. No, mother, I need love, not shame. Okay. The baby is hurt, but there's no time. The hurt clicks in the compulsion to get a better outcome, to undo the pain, to undo it, to correct it, to get a better, proper loved outcome. Baby doesn't understand time. So in every new situation, he's emotionally still in the past. Mother, love not shame, love not shame. So in the present, they're gonna stage the whole thing, recreate the whole thing to play that record. Mother, this time will you give me love, not shame? But in the in, but trauma before 18 months, um, a thing takes place called identification with the aggressor, where the baby identifies the shaming mother. So in the present, to replay the record of how the mother shamed them, in the present, they're gonna shame others to replay how the mother shamed them. Okay. So that's their cry for love, in effect. Um, if trauma takes place post 18 months, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's more direct. Um, when people uh, replay the trauma of the mother rejecting them, they just coax others to reject them. Okay. So they prod others, uh, be difficult towards others to, to reject them, to replay the mother rejected them. But when trauma is over, over severely the case, uh, the child can't do that. He identifies with the aggressor and kind of clicks over and his emotional derailment is uh, more uh, derailed or something. So he's going to become the shaming other, shaming others. Hence they're called the stinger personality patterns. Because when, because when they replay how their mother shamed them, they just find others, non-threatening substitute others, stand in for their innocence. They become the shaming mother, shame others to re replay how the mother shamed them. Okay, so, um, so that's the, Edmund Burglar has a metaphor for this. Every neurotic is a music enthusiast, but he only has one record, a vinyl music disc record. And there's only one tune on it, the cry for love, right? He carries this one record with him everywhere he goes, and every, and every time he sees a record player with never-ending fiery ardor, 
he spins that, he plays that tool, he, he plays that record. Meaning he's going to recreate, reorchestrate, like a theater thing. Uh, Masterson calls it transference acting out. You're going to transfer the childhood scene with the mother into present, transfer the past into present, and then act it out like actors acting out. You're going to act like be an actor and cast others to be co actors and reorchestrate like a theater thing. It's like an as if thing to symbolize, metaphorize the past and to, like, do the whole staging thing like a theater thing. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, the purpose is part A, the emotionality is still from the past. Mother, uh, no, uh, don't hurt me, I need love. Don't hurt me, I need love. They're playing that one tune. But the sting of trauma before 18 months, uh, it, takes a more distur it takes a more twisted, disturbed form where the baby identifies as the aggressor. So when they replay the record in the present, they find others to play their lost innocence. They, be the, they will be the shaming mother to recreate and replay the original charm of the mother shaming them. They, they just shame others to replay how the mother shamed them. So that's why they're called the stinger personality patterns because they're hurting others to replay how the mother hurt them, but it doesn't work. Really, does hurting others change what happened in the nursery? No, it's not, the, it's, the present isn't the past. Okay. But, uh, but a person doing this is meant to know how the mother treated them. So the, the way Stinger's personality patterns treat others, that's for them to know how the mother treated them. So that's, how, that's the unconscious self communicating to the conscious self. Hey you, I'm showing you what happened. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you. So some burglar calls the unconscious self or secret self or unknown, okay? Um, uh, all the memories very early on, all the energy, life force into the person. Uh, the puppet master is going to get the conscious self uh, to replay in the present, relive in the present. It's as if the unconscious self uh, is telling the conscious self, hey conscious self, wa watch what you're doing. I'm going to get you to distort the present, misperceive the present, misunderstand the present, make up the present. And I'm going to get you to act like your mother. And I'm going to get you to see others as you. And I'm going to get you to treat others the way your mother treated you because I want you to see how your mother treated you. So the Papa Master is saying, can you observe this? I'm helping you to see how you were treated. Okay? Because then we can make a therapeutic turning point because the person can then can consciously see, oh my God, no, this isn't the nursery. I'm not the mother. I'm shaming myself. I'm seeing myself onto others. I'm shaming myself, seeing onto others. Okay, that's so-called perverse thinking discussed in part one. That's very disturbed. Doesn't make sense. It's not logical. Right? It's called primary process mentation. Again, okay, today's topic is called trans logic, because then he'll cover it up with some excuse. Okay. Trans logic, double think, right? So he'll he'll shame others to replay how the mother shamed them, but then but then when they do that, they are reminded of how the mother shamed them. Okay. Now because they become the mother, uh, they're going to say the one they just shamed just hurt them, shamed them. So they shame others. And they think and, and they feel badly about it. They say the victim they just hurt hurt that is the cause for why they feel bad of why so, okay. So what when so they triggered up their own feelings, in other words. So mother shamed them. Later on, they play the record, they recreate it, they shame others to replay the mother shamed them. As they shame others to replay that record, and they don't know that they're imitating the mother, they're reliving re-experiencing how the mother shamed them. So now in the present, they're feeling it's come, it's come, it's triggered up a little bit. They think, now I feel badly when I shame the other. Well, that's because the one I just shamed is the, the aggressor who just shamed me. So they're gonna blame the other one. So they blame the victim, right? So they're the aggressor and they, think the, the and they feel badly. They think the victim is the cause of their bad feeling. That's called trance logic. Trance logic or double think, okay? Double think. Okay, because the self and the other are still fused. They can act the aggressive, feel like the victim, they flip it around, okay, and, and, they make, and they cover it up with rationalization, excuses, okay, to hide it all, kind of thing, right? So this is today's topic. It's called trans logic. A uh, new phrase, I've never heard of this phrase. Uh, somebody on a podcast mentioned it. And that was a curious uh, phrase there. Um, so I looked into it a little bit. So we'll do one video today on this trans logic. And I couldn't fit all the quotes in. Uh, so in the next video tomorrow, uh, we'll do three or four more quotes uh, to add on to today's video. So all of the quotes today will be on this thing called trans logic. 
which is kind of like double think. But the point they're making is uh, it's, it's primary process mentation. Like the cat says in Alice in Wonderland, it's mad in there. It's mad in there, right? It's, it's, uh, it's the dream world. It's primary process. So again, primary process thinking, the dream world, myth and fairy tale world. Um, so there's no time in there. Things are wildly exaggerated. Okay, the baby's emotions of rage, he can project onto the mother. Says the mother's enraged. Baby's unmet need ended up with oral greed fantasies. Projects onto the mother and thinks the mother's a hungry wolf that wants to eat him, or the cyclops that wants to eat him, or the witch, like in Hansel and Gretel, the witch wants to eat the children. Okay, that's translogic primary process mentation. Things are exaggerated. Myths and fairy tales are from there. So again, myths and fairy tales describe this memory mapping imagery. Okay, again, it's pre in the beginning. The baby doesn't have verbal uh, verbal uh, memory. It's, it's pre-verbal, pre-verbal or pictorial images. Um, and it's timeless in there. Baby's small, helpless, dependent size. Mother has all the power, so things are wildly exaggerated. Okay, the baby's trait of rage, the mother's in rage. Okay, the baby's uh, wanting to take him. No, the mother wants to take him in. He ends up with a slogan in later in life. Okay, and later in life, he might say, Well, it's my greed or your greed. Eat or be eaten. He'll have this infantile, traumatized uh, template. And, he, and later in life, he might have a slogan for life that represents that traumatized template. So in other words, someone can know that there's trauma if someone has a slogan like that. And on YouTube, you can hear some guy saying this, making a big speech about it. Oh no, it's my greed or your greed. He's very convinced about it. Okay, that's a sign of trauma. That when that person was a baby, let's say, okay, I think it's fair to, okay, so I'm going, this all theory, right? Part one, my disclaimer, all theory, speculation. 30% is wrong. Everyone's got to kind of question this themselves. So the theory is, if someone has a slogan like that, my greed or your greed, uh, it seems to be uh, they're describing the existential conclusion. Um, okay. uh, that's in the memory system, and they put words to that to know that. So someone, someone saying something like, my greed or your greed, my envy or your envy, it seems to come from a place of trauma, infantile, early on trauma, where the baby's unmet need turn into greed. No babies are greedy, but when they're unloved, they become greedy. That's oral greed. Baby's enraged by this, shamed and enraged. Okay, creates an image of the mother as a monster, wants to eat him, so he doesn't want to feel victimized. So he identifies with the aggressor and says, well, if I'm not the greedy one, then I'm going to be eaten by the monster image that I created of my mother. So eat or be eaten. That's called perverse thinking, disturbed thinking, psychotic thinking, whatever terms we call it, but that's a sign of trauma. So a lot of this uh, disturbed thinking can also be called trance logic. Trance logic, that's the theory here, working hypotheses on my end. Crazy wisdom. Double speak. Oh, okay, no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, let, forget that one. So, okay, one guy here, who is it? Wizard. He says, well, wisdom is positive, right? Crazy. It doesn't mean like creative wisdom. He just means like illogical wisdom. So it's a paradox, right? That's, that was sort of his example. Paradoxical double speak, such as psychotic wisdom. So let's do it that way. May induce trans logic, a kind of hypnotic, uncritical acceptance of contradictory statements. Yeah, if someone says to you, psychotic wisdom, what's that? Like, whoa, like, like contradictory. That's a sign of trauma. The self and the other are still fused and there's trauma there. Okay, so the contradictory is the, the aggressor and the victim. Okay, um, so there's a lot of contradictions there because, because of the fusion, one can act like the aggressor, feel like the victim. So there's a trans logic in that area. That's what they mean by trans logic. So trans logic comes from trauma. Trans logic or double think comes from trauma in the first three years, right? So you'll see, you'll see this in sales, you'll see this in propaganda, you'll see this outwardly, okay? You can't dazzle them with your confusing, or confuse them with your rhetoric and all your uh, logical fallacies. The idea is to conf be confusing, because if you're confusing, okay, uh, enter Eric Burns, games people play, Helmut Kaiser's duplicity theory, and all these kind of things that are confusing, hypnotic, that's because a person the person speaking is from a place that they needed the cry for love for fusion. Everything is love or a cry for love. 
If the trauma takes place before 18 months, it's the cry for fusion. It's the cry for oneness. Either the baby didn't get it, that's the bully pattern, Iago pattern, lower functioning BPD, BPD pattern, the psychopaths, all the more disturbed ones. Um, in the narcissistic pattern, they want a positive fusion. They're stuck with a negative fusion. They want a positive fusion. So before 18 months, um, it's an issue of symbiosis. Okay, our, our song for this for the time being is Constant Craving by the singer Katie Lang. Constant craving, what's this constant craving? You're looking for the fusion. So all these games people play, Eric Burns' idea, all this projective identification, for example, we want to coax others to feel what you don't know that you're feeling, thinking that if they're feeling what you're feeling, that means you're back in the nursery, mother's feeling what you're feeling, then if mother's feeling what you're feeling, then mother's going to soothe you. So that's looking for the oneness. So projective identification, you gaslighting is a part of it because you're going to deny their feelings and their situation, and you want to coax them to feel what you're feeling, but you don't know that you're feeling it, but you want them to feel it. So you feel a little excitement about that because you're back in the nursery emotionally and mother's going to soothe me. So, so everything is love or a cry for love. If the person is traumatized, they go through life with a record called the cry for love. Love, not shame. Love, not shame. Okay, let's, let's back up a sec. So let's repeat it one more time. Edmund Berger, one of our mentors, puts, has this example about the record. Okay. So neurosis is the petrification of an infantile comp conflict that's repressed. The conflict is the cry for love. He wants love, he's being uh, rejected. So that's a conflict. He wants, but he's afraid, he's going to be rejected. It's a conflict, right? And it's repressed, he doesn't know it. And he's, neurosis means he's going to be neurotic, means he's not going to enjoy the present, distort the present, still living in the past. Okay, the Greenberg, again with the Greenberg quote, he's going to have trouble living in the present. He's not going to see the present because he's dwelling in the past, reliving the past, not enjoying the present. Hence our song by Zaz, the singer Zaz. Are you, are you going to love life? Are you going to love and love life? Or are you going to watch it pass by because you're afraid? And that'd be like a, that'd be like a, a blurred over cry for love that you're afraid to even admit kind of thing, right? That'd be the cry for love that you're afraid to even acknowledge. You know, like you're stunned uh, with the trauma in the past, right? So when the baby's traumatized, it's kind of emotionally stunned, right? That's called petrification, turned to stone, emotionality turned to stone, or frozen or feeling unreal like the velveteen rabbit, or feeling wooden or flat like the, the, the block of wood that the carpenter. I still don't know the full story. So apparently some, car, some story about a carpenter takes a block of wood, carves out this little boy there, and, and prays and wants the boy to come to life. Okay, an imagery metaphor that a person might feel kind of like that flattened wooden toy. He wants thing to come to, the, the boy to come to life kind of thing. Okay, the Velveteen Rabbits. I want to be real, the rabbit keeps saying, right? I want to be, what, what does it mean to be real? I want to feel real. Okay, the frozen woolly, frozen woolly mammoth might be an image of petrification, right? Uh, the petrified frog from the sitcom, The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis. And uh, in myths, a lot of statues are like that, right? Echo turns to stone in the narcissist myth. Okay, and, we, and so on, right? So that's the issue of trauma. Um, so from this traumatic place, we may have trans logic. It's the primary process world. This trans logic, okay, believing contradictory things and not even noticing them, that's the trans logic because you're coming from the self and the other trauma, traumatic blurring there. So that's why you believe things uh, that are contradictory because it's, it's comes, because it links you back to the memory of needing the good oneness of the mother. So people may be drawn to trans logic because maybe they think it reminds them of their trauma and hence the cry for love. Mother, I need love. I'm back with you in my imagining. Can, can you provide love? So trans logic seems to be a cry for love. Like double think is a cry for love. Okay. Um, any negativity towards others is actually a cry for love. Burglar says, look mother in the mind. I'm trying to show you what you did to me. I'm going to treat others the way you treated me because I want to show you how you treated me. That's their cry for love. Burglar calls this a negative magic gesture. Negative, really? You think, mother, you think there's gonna be a time machine that takes the person back to the nursery? Mother gets the message and changes her ways? Doesn't work. But that's sort of his positive intention. It's his cry for love. But it's so disturbed and perverted and all this, it's not gonna work, right? Paul Libby Russell, TQ2119 says, a person's gonna have 20 lifetimes. Boy, this caffeine is really kicking in today, huh? Okay. Um, you see, you're seeing me speak a little more quickly because uh, 
I've just finished uh, the coffee here. <laughs> I don't know if it's helpful or not, talking quickly like this. Um, you know, the truth is, uh, we have a quote tomorrow. Should I dig it up? Hang on a sec. You know, tomorrow we've got some very good quotes tomorrow. This one here about... Uh, if you're feeling bored by my speaking, we got a quote about this tomorrow. Here it is here. If you're feeling bored, when I'm speaking, if you feel bored by my speaking, or if you feel like drowsy or sleepiness or something, maybe it's an unconscious communication on my end that when I was a baby, I felt uh, not alive. Like my golden ball was squelched. Because huh? I'm inducing in someone else unknowingly. Okay, so here's the quote here. The analyst's sleepiness. So sometimes the client sees that. Again, I haven't been analyzed. I, I haven't been analyzed. I haven't done this process. I, I very much wish I can. If I had the funds, I'd be on the next flight uh, and find a therapist to do the process. And I'm assuming that when I'm speaking, the therapist might feel sleepy. Maybe he'll think, oh, okay, he, he, he felt unalive because he's inducing it in me kind of thing. But here's, okay, so if the therapist uh, is talking to somebody and he's sleepy, uh, assuming he's not very tired or something, right? Maybe, so that theory is here. The analyst's or the therapist's sleepiness, this may be an enactment or like a, like a reenactment, like a transference communication, right? Of the parental unavailability. Mother wasn't around, right? Mother abandoned him emotionally. Okay. And then because of that, the client is communicating so-called primitive communication from the client about early states of psychological unaliveness or flatness feeling flat, something like that, right? So I'm just wondering if somebody's feeling bored by my speaking, maybe it's, it's a, a reflection that I don't have my golden ball uh, fully uh, in me, right? My feelings uh, depends on my moods, I guess. Right? Maybe sometimes people are interested when I speak, but based on the, based on the watch count, uh, I don't have many viewers. Although a few people have ordered 1001 Women's of the Mind. So I, I feel like there's some interest in this, uh, self, on these self-help quotes. Again, 10,000 advanced self-help quotes helping one to be their own story medicine doctor, their own story medicine practitioner. Again, I only have a BA, so keep that in mind. My, my full disclaimer is more in part one. But I thought that's a good quote. Uh, Because unknowingly, we try to induce others through a process known as, because uh, we're trying to communicate how we feel. So if somebody else feels kind of bored and flat, and oh, what's this guy saying? I don't know, what, is, what does he want? What is he saying? I don't get it. That means the projector is trying to say, well, I feel uh, sleepy inside, unalive inside, so to speak, right? Sleepwalking, yeah, sleepwalking through life kind of thing. That's the theory, right? That's so we'll talk. We'll we'll do this. We'll do that quote again tomorrow. So that's just sort of a preview. Um, in part one, I was also doing a preview of this quote by Miriam Mernabo, Mernabo from Brazil. She does a very good quote here. So let's uh, do it here. Yeah, I was just about to get into it in part one. I got cut off with the technology here. Uh, I'm using a very, very dated, uh, I bought this laptop almost 10 years ago from a shop. They said they were going to recycle it. I said, oh, okay, I'll buy it. I got a good price. Still, I'm still using it 10 years later. It's a great, great product. And my, my iPhone is also like an older model, but it's, still, it's working quite well. So I appreciate, uh, I appreciate the men and women that made all this. Um, ok, 
Okay, so um, okay, so in summary, um, we're gonna talk. So in this video, we're gonna talk about translogic being a symptom of trauma. But before I get there, let me finish up what I started to do in part one because I feel like I've got I've gotten off track here. Let me finish up what I was doing in part one. So in part one, I was leading up to 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 the preview quote for tomorrow. So I want to now do this preview quote. So in part one, we were talking about that if there's trauma early on, the person doesn't, they're, they're going to take refuge in the old belief that they had in the uterus that they were a little god. All babies think they're little gods. Primary narcissism, infantile megalomania, the glorified self, the idealized self, this illusionary image um, that, they're, that, they're, that they're everything. Okay, babies in the uterus think it's all them, every, they're everything, right? Um, now this normal, that, that false belief normally dissipates roughly at 18 months, but if they're traumatized, they're still stuck there. So that's the issue of trauma. And then uh, that's one of the issues of trauma, that they didn't separate from the mother, and they're still in that illusionary fusion with the mother, one with the mother and the mind kind of thing. And they can't tell the difference or parse out where they begin and end, where the mother begins and ends. And the baby might think that the mother's him, the power of the mother is his power, he feels invincible and entitled and all these kinds of things, right? So the baby has part object relating, nursing with the breast mother, not really seeing like the mother is a full separate person with feelings. Baby's just sort of just relating mainly to the breast mother. And later on he sees the mother as a full person. But in the first few weeks kind of thing, it's just mainly the nipple on the breast for the baby. It's like part object relating. It's a problem there. That's going to lead to narcissism. And, and treating others in that part object utilitarian kind of manner. That, that's, that's, uh, that, that's why people who are very traumatized early on, uh, may treat others uh, kind of uh, in a utilitarian uh, kind of way because they didn't they didn't develop uh, out of the oneness of the mother to a temp to a psychological template of mother loving them having been loved by the mother I'm okay you're okay they're still fused there and it's problematic there so they're still looking for that oneness so the trans logic is a reflection of that but the trans logic double thing is a reflection. Uh, maybe of that looking for the ones all these games people play Eric Burns describes about all these lies and all these like innuendos and uh, rhetorics and uh, you know a lot of misleading ideas uh, sins of omission tricking aha get catch gotcha game like all these kinds of uh, manip verbal manipulations and um, you know uh, a half truth is the father of many lies the best way to tell a lie is to include a few crumbs of truth in it. Um, you know, a lot of straw man arguments, red herring arguments, equivocations, glittering generalities. Um, you know, a lot of transferring taking place. Um, oh, yeah. I still got to get used to sort of the, my new environment here. I, I was saying in part one, I'm so glad that uh, I, I, I have... Uh, that I have access to this room here. But I gotta get used to the, some of the things behind me. But that's that's my issue here, yeah. Okay. I got to make a kind of compromise here. I, I got the benefit of the room, but I got to kind of, it's not perfect. I got to accept the gratitude of this, but I got to kind of manage uh, the imperfection of it all, right? So I'm grateful to this. I got to accept the reality that it can't, you know, it is what it is, right? Kind of thing. Okay, let, let's, let's do a preview of uh, Minerbo's quote, a shrink from Brazil. I just discovered it this morning. So again, as mentioned in part one, all babies think they're little gods, right? So the phrase for this, some shrinks use the phrase, His Majesty the Baby, right? And Minerbo was saying, I like what she does here. She talks about... When a person doesn't accept any kind of losses or admit any kind of disappointments, or they have all or nothing thinking, perfect or forget it. Like, you know, I gotta confess, there is a little a temptation in me almost to regress to that. Like, well, this place isn't good enough, so I'm gonna find some other place, 
right? Because I got a lot of the, uh, sometimes the staff have their breaks and all this, and so they get, sometimes they're a little animated, but that's, that's their break time and all this, whatever, right? And I think, well, uh, but hang on here. Where's this entitlement from? I, I'm glad to have this room here. So let, let me see if I can make this work. Uh, maybe it does cause me a little distractions a little bit. It's, I'm, in a, I'm in an awkward situation. I'm in a very busy city. It's hard to find places to do these videos. Um, you know, maybe later on I'll be on the shoreline. Uh, I, I, for a brief time, I did some videos on the shoreline with birds flying by. You want to hear a funny thing? I did 17 videos on the shoreline last summer. Yeah, a year ago, exactly a year ago, last summer. 17 very good videos on a shoreline with birds flying by with the waves and everything. Mysteriously, those 17 videos all disappeared on me. I don't know if it's, maybe it's possible I accidentally deleted it, but I, it's very strange why that happened. So those videos are lost, unfortunately. 17 very good videos, 50 hours of commentary got lost. But the good news is the quotes are preserved. So we, we, I've got the quotes on the videos. Um, so those, those videos are marked. Um, you know, TQ something to something without commentary. Um, so we, so I had the quotes are there. Or if you go to the coffee page, the complete encyclopedia, the complete encyclopedia of insights are there. So all of the quotes are preserved. That's great. But I lost a lot of commentary when I was on the shoreline. Um, it was very peaceful for the most part. And um, geez, sometimes yeah, sometimes the stuff gets a little animated. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's just keep going here. Prime, primary morning. Primary morning. Okay, so she's saying here, this shrink from Brazil, she's saying here, if a person doesn't admit little losses or disappointments or they have all or nothing thinking, that's because they didn't deal with primary morning. The primary morning is, if a person is traumatized, they didn't mourn the loss of not getting the proper love that they needed. Like there was a missing good mother. They got to mourn the loss of a good mother that never existed. So they got to they gotta resolve this issue of the grandiosity that they're still dealing with and the expectation that somebody should provide the perfect conditions. So they got to dis, they got to somehow forgive the mother for that. That's called mourning. Okay, so Bruce Springsteen on YouTube, Independence Day, Toronto, you listen to the introduction that he gives to that song. Okay, um, and then Recognize that the parents are just people of, of faults and all this. Uh, you know, they've been yapping the whole time I've been here, right? Eh? What's that? I've been listening to their yapping for almost two hours. Uh, should I move? Maybe I can move. Right? The problem is, uh, I've got, I gotta keep this thing plugged in to have the battery working. So I'm kind of stuck here. Yeah, so sorry, this video is gonna be a little bit. Uh, not as uh, easy going as I'd like. You're gonna see my anxiety, my little triggering, my triggered feelings come up. Sometimes they stop, oh, is it over? And then 10 minutes later, it's, it flares up again. Kind of, you know. okay, hold on a sec. See, I gotta remember this is this is their workplace. This is their this is their uh, place where I'm a guest. Um, they're being nice to me. They extend a little leeway for, to allow me to use this room as long as I buy one of their coffees here. So I got some balance there. Ambivalence. I have okay. Uh, let me get back on track here. Okay, I have a we have a quote in our self help thread called "What's the hardest thing about." So it's a five word question prompt. If something's, if you're triggered by something, if something's on your mind, you preface it uh, with the five words. What's the hardest thing about, and you fill in the blank. Let me try it here. So what's the, so Marcus, what's the hardest thing about, uh, you know, present, trying to present this while you're hearing, um, you know, voices around you, right? Well, it takes my attention 
onto them, onto the voices. Okay, so what's that about? Well, it, see, it seems, uh, so why does that happen? So why does that, so, okay, go on. So your attention is out, then your, ten, then your attention is out of the video. Yeah, so I'm, that means I'm not present in the video. That means if I'm not present in the video, that means somebody's going to be bored watching, like we said here, because I'm not present myself. If, if I'm a little triggered, that's a, like I'm scared inside kind of thing, I'm triggered. That means I'm not alive in the present for the for the audience. Just to apply today's quote here. Okay, okay go on. That's that, that's part of it. You're, you're, I'm, I'm a little diverting here. Well, the real issue is. Um, Maybe it reminds me of when I was a child and there was the neighbors are screaming or something or maybe the parents are shouting or fighting. Maybe it reminds me of something like that. Maybe there's some unconscious fears around when I was a child hearing a lot loud things going on. And sometimes they do have like a little high pitch, so some of the, uh, when they get into their animated. See, I don't really think they're arguing anything. I just think they're just uh, excited talking, right? Maybe some, Maybe I can hear people saying, I want to say this, no, I, uh, listen to me or something. So maybe, although they aren't arguing, maybe it does remind me of the, when my parents are arguing or when the neighbors are arguing or something. Maybe I haven't really kind of uh... so, how, so how do I kind of uh, put a buffer there or, or uh, strengthen myself to, to not be triggered by that kind of thing, right? Well, in the meantime, I can play. I can play a song. And the song. When the song finishes, maybe they'll calm down. Because the last time I was here, it was for the most part pretty quiet. It was good. Yeah, that's why I was able to do a five and a half hour video because it was pretty quiet. So I got to keep that in mind. Sometimes it is kind of quiet back there. Uh, sometimes, yeah, they do get kind of loud back there. Like that. Yeah. So it's a balance, all right. Primary mourning, let's just read the quote here. Primary mourning, a process by which we manage to emotionally integrate a double loss, two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, the loss of the subjective position in which I see myself as His Majesty the baby to whom all is due. On the other hand, the loss of the absolute mother of early childhood. I lose the illusion and therefore the expectation that something or someone will totally fulfill me. Yeah, so I, I can't have any kind of expectation that this environment will totally fulfill me. I mean, my, see there is right there. Eh? If I do have that expectation, this is triggering into some kind of my own His Majesty the baby if I'm supposed to think they gotta be like nice and quiet for me or something and make, make it smooth, as smooth, you know. I can't expect uh, everything that I want kind of thing, right? Um, it is a painful and always incomplete process, but it has two fundamental compensations from the point of view of the aptitude for happiness. First, the discovery of the other as an other subject this discovery is fundamental because many of the pleasures and joys in life are experienced in the relationship with the other. Okay, so yeah, they were friendly to me. They're very nice staff when I met them and they hand me the coffee and all this. And I had little, little, little exchanges there. They seem very pleasant and all this. So yeah, I'm meeting people who are, who are uh, persons and their, and their, their uniqueness and all that. So there's a discovery in that area, right? The second achievement provided by mourning is to get out of the emotional logic of all or nothing. In other words, the mourning process or the exit of primary narcissism is the absolutely, is the absolutely necessary condition for the aptitude for happiness. Yeah, so she was saying, if, if, I'm, if, I, if I expect a perfection or something uh, and I think an all or nothing, uh, you're not going to go through life uh, uh, all too happy because uh, 
you want to get to a place of reality and three-dimensionality and uh, that their person is in their own right, it's on our break time, uh, they may have anxiety, uh, you know, and, uh, and if I'm triggered, does that tap into me, some kind of a... So she's saying to accept little losses and disappointments, it's because you accepted the primary loss of long ago. Right? That's the theory here. So her example was, uh, I'll, maybe I'll play, you know what I'll do, I'll play it tomorrow, because I just discovered this. So I'll play her speaking about this, or you can look it up on YouTube. All of the videos of hers are done in Spanish or Portuguese or whatever. Uh, I notice her speaking in Spanish, but they say she's Brazilian. Okay, whatever. There's only one in English, uh, so that's the one there from the new books. Uh, uh, is it, no, the International Psychoanalytic Association podcast, that one there. Oh yeah, interesting podcast. Half of the people I can't, I can't follow like that. Uh, like, like, uh, like a lot of shrinks from around the world, English is their second language. And I start to listen and they're using their own jargon. I can barely make it out. Yikes. Uh, she's okay, this one here. Monero's okay. I can, I can hear her. I've sort of given up on that podcast, to tell you the truth. It's just so much work to listen to those guys. It's better just to read what they write. Kind of can skim through it. Also tomorrow, Lewis, okay, we'll talk, we'll have a couple of quotes about defense mechanisms and um, so yeah, we got some good quotes tomorrow, um, we got some good quotes tomorrow. Trans logic. So uh, this comes. This phrase comes from a guy named Orn, 1959. Orn suggested that hypnosis was characterized by trance logic, which he described um, as a kind of peaceful coexistence between illusion and reality. The essence of trance logic is that the hypnotized person appears to be able to believe simultaneously ideas or perceptions which are incompatible and to be unaware and to be unaware of their incompatibility he reported that if hypnotized subjects are instructed to negatively hallucinate a chair i.e. imagine that the chair is not there then when instructed also to walk around the room with their eyes open they refrain from bumping into the chair while maintaining that they are unable to see the chair so this, I think, is sort of the, the source point, the source point of this idea of trans logic. So we don't do hypnosis here at all. We have nothing on hypnosis. That's not a threat here. I don't think I'm going to go there at all. There's a whole body of material about this. But just to, maybe as, a, um, as an illustration of where this phrase comes up, if I understand it correctly, the guy, some guy was hypnotized. Okay, walk around the room with your eyes open. Um, now that chair in the middle of the room, that chair in the middle of the room that you, that um, I want you to believe that it's not there. It's not there. Now go ahead, not just walk around free, freely around the room. And he would do so, but never touch the chair. And later on, or during the time, he would say, oh, there's no chair here, but he would walk around it. Do you see a chair? I don't see any chair. You told me not to see chair. So this has something to do in trauma. The theory is in trauma. You see, uh, there's identification with the aggressor. So you please the so the, the hypnotist is the aggressor. You're going to bleed with them because when the baby is traumatized, he thinks like the mother. They're one there. So the hypnotist is saying, okay, don't see the chair. But a part of them knows there's a chair, so it's, it's not fully right. There's a split there. So for his survival, he's not going to hit the chair, but he's going to believe and please the mother. So a lot of this is pleasing the mother. So when the baby's traumatized, he's going to think like the mother, please the mother. Right? So the hypnotist uh, 
taps into this mechanism known as identification with the aggressor. So that's why they said when people are hypnotized, a lot of the times they're just one with the aggressor voice, pleasing the mother, pleasing the parent. So the hypnotist uh, hypnotizes the person. I want you to uh, think, walk around like you're a chicken or something. He wants to please the mother. Because in trauma, the baby wants to please the mother, to have the attachment, whatever the mother wants. It's, the baby has to please the mother. Uh, to feel safe, to, to win her love. The baby, no baby can make it out with, without a mother. So whatever the mother says, whatever her conditions are, the baby's gonna comply. So in, hyp in hypnosis, they kind of trigger that. Uh, so the, um, the guy's gonna comply. So, um, so they revoked the original psychic uh, template of complying uh, to the mother. So hypnosis is a kind of a, a mirror for that thing that happened back then. Um, so here it is here. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah, here it is here. Hypnosis was the means by which uh, Charcot legitimated, legitimated the concept of trauma by proposing that the hysterical crisis that he suggestively induced, okay, so like the acting out, the emotional acting out, whatever, okay, act like a chicken for me or something, huh? uh, that he induced in his uh, patients who are reproductions of traumatic scenes. What is less well understood is that hypnosis was not just an instrument of research and treatment, but played a major theoretical role in the conceptualization of trauma. So we're talking about so we're talking about way back the origin of understanding trauma, the link between hypnosis and understanding trauma. There's a link there, right? This is because the tendency of hypnotized persons to imitate or repeat whatever they were told to say or do provided a basic model for the traumatic experience. Trauma was defined as a situation of disassociation or absence from the self in which the victim unconsciously imitated or identified with the aggressor, right? In a condition that was likened to a, a state of heightened suggestibility or hypnotic trance. So the hypnotist is replaying the baby trauma of him being one with the mother. He just reactivated the whole thing. So this hypnotist, this hypnotist idea, although they were researching, look at how do we face repressed memories. Now we give up on that because we don't want to look for repressed memories without consciousness. That's why we don't cover hypnosis here at all. No way. We want to do the opposite. We want to encourage consciousness. Not, not bypass it and make you and, and bring up memories that you're not aware of. It's, that's why it's sort of given up. But a lot of people are still researching it, which is interesting at the same time. Um, the, the mind is split or disassociated. It is, no, it is unable to register the wound to the psyche because the ordinary, the ordinary mechanisms of, of awareness and cognition are destroyed. As a result, the victim is unable to recollect and integrate the hurtful experience in normal consciousness. Instead, she is haunted or possessed by intrusive traumatic memories. The experience of trauma, frozen or fixed in time, refuses to be represented as past, but is perpetually re-experienced in a painful, disassociated traumatic present. See, see the, the emotional freezing, it's in the present. So the hypnosis taps into that because they're still in, they're transferring the past into the present. So in trauma, they're frozen in the past. They go with the emotions in life, still with the emotional, they're transferring or seeing the past emotions in the present. That's what he means here. Okay, dreaming in its purest form. So this is primary process world, the dreaming world, fifth and fairy tale world, this unconscious thinking world, primary process mentation. Dreaming, this dreaming area is the purest form of primary mentation accessible if the hypnotic state involves 
a shift toward primary process mentation, then it should be no surprise that both hypnotized individuals and dreamers report their experiences as visitations, not as something they create. Yeah, so when you're dreaming, something occurs to you. So in hypnosis, or oh, something occurred to me, like in the dream world, right? So the hypnosis is your, your, your kind of re-evoking that, that world. So that's why we don't, uh, that, that's why bother do that? It's, the, it's unproductive. It's better to promote consciousness. Yeah, okay. So uh, one guy interpreted trauma as involving the repetition of an infantile mechanism of emotional identification with the mother that entailed such a hypnotic fusion, a hypnotic fusion between self and other as to preclude uh, a, a self-representation. Yeah, so in, in hypnosis, he's saying here, you lose your self-representation, so you're doing what the mother wants. You're the mother, but the hypnotist is your mother. So the mother says, do this, the hypnotist says, the hypnotist says do this. You're in an emotional place of where the baby is going to do what the mother wants because he lost his self-representation. So in trauma, we lose the self-representation. Yeah? So that's why in hypnosis, people do what the hypnotist says because they, they lost their sense of self. So some people are easily uh, hypnotized. Um, that's because uh, they're, they're, they're traumatized. Some people who are not easily traumatized, um, it's either because they have a sense of self, well, I'm not gonna, what, what are you trying to do here? You're trying to push your regression on me? I don't wanna go into that backward, I wanna go forward, not backward kind of thing. That's so, that, so people with some sense of self are not gonna be easily hypnotized. Or ironically, some people who are easily hypnotized, they're just so aggressively afraid of such a thing, they do like a counterphobia thing where they put up a wall against it to protect themselves. Okay, so we'll, we'll uh, pick up on this tomorrow and a few other quotes. So let's go, let's uh, pick up on this uh, trans uh, logic area here. Okay, trans logic, as if you were trying to understand the logic of a dream. Yeah. That's a very good summary of the topic, right? Dream interpretation, what is going on? You don't take things at face value because there's, things are displaced. Something can represent another. It's a labyrinth in there. No time. Like you wake up in the morning, you had a dream sequence that blended in a childhood scene with something you saw on TV the night before. What kind of logic is that? Um, if there's no time, it's illogical. There is time. In secondary real, real life, there is time. But the unconscious doesn't understand time. So trans logic is in this area of the primary mentation, the myth and fairy tale world, the Alice in Wonderland world. Now, when people speak using trans logic, Trying to confuse you, double thing, something emotional, something partly true, something irrational, and you go, oh, okay. okay that, that, that they're coming from that place. And others with that trauma are going to be hypnotized by it. And then if they're hypnotized, then the speaker can give suggestion and they'll follow it like the hypnotist. Okay? So he, he was talking about, I think he was talking, one guy was talking about the, the so called, uh, these. Cult, the self-help, some of these self-help cult leader, guru kind of people, right? They would speak in a confusing way. Everybody's bedazzled, okay? Because that, that confusing way bedazzles people. Um, and then whatever then he then says, are they going to do? Because in the self-help thing, the corrupt uh, cult leader guy, he wants fusion by them. And he may not know it himself. That's the thing, right? So, and we know about the famous examples, right? The call leader says to the followers, okay, do such and such. And they, and they may do such a, such a self-destructive thing. Because he tapped in to their trauma 
that when they were a baby, they lost their sense of self and they'll, they'll do the mother's voice because they become the mother's voice. The hypnotist is giving them the mother's voice, now they're following the hypnotist. And that's the cult, that's the trick of the cult, the, the corrupt uh, cult uh, leader guy. Okay, so he's, he's, he's doing this trans logic thing because he's traumatized and he's co-opting it or he's not aware of it or he's aware, I don't know. And the others are in a similar state. So, so there's the key nugget here. The baby loses a sense of self, identifies with the aggressor. Now, if the mother says to the baby, I want this, I want that, baby's always trying to please the mother. What do you want, mother? What do you need, mother? Because the baby needs paradise with the mother. Baby must attach to the mother. Baby, uh, Morton Keeson thinks that the baby's even gonna try to save the mother, cure the mother, please the mother, accommodate the mother. What do you want, mother? I, I, I gotta make you be loving, so if I gotta sacrifice myself to please you for that, he'll try. There's a self-help book entitled By the Baby. Mother, as a baby speaking, Mother, do I have to give up me to be loved by you? Similar idea. So this is the psychology of um, the, the advertising and the PR and the propaganda, the persuasion uh, to do what others, to do what the hypnotist is saying to the people. Because the victimized, because they're traumatized. And the hypnotist, like the cult leader, taps, is giving the voice of the conditionality that you got to please the mother. So a lot of this hypnotism he's saying is pleasing the mother. Right? So the, the cult guru guy, whatever, is, is tapping into that, oh, please me. Okay, uh, give me all your money or whatever, whatever the tricks they do, right? And then, then they donate all their money to these things. And then he takes off on a yacht or something. He says, um, okay, trans logic, as if you were trying to understand the logic of a dream. Trans logic. Perceptions are fused in a manner that ignores everyday logic. Like a drama which wins a holy, willing suspension of disbelief, thoughts have free reign and unchecked by contradiction and critical reflection are given a degree of credibility not unlike that granted to dreams during sleep. Okay, so his sort of uh, analogy here was just like when we watch a film uh, on, the, uh, on the TV screen, um, we a little bit kind of accept uh, uh, that it's unreal, right? We suspend, we don't question, we just we go along with the story kind of thing. So there's a similar uh, overlap there. Okay, trans logic refers to a person's ability to mix freely his perception, his, his perceptions derived from reality with those that stem from his imagination in a manner that ignores everyday logic. A quality of this associative process related to what in hypnosis is called trans logic, the simultaneous juxtaposition of incompatible realities without anxiety or notice. Okay, paradoxical doublespeak, such as psychotic wisdom, let's say, may induce trans logic, a kind of hypnotic, uncritical acceptance of contradictory statements. Trans logic, an altered mental state in which a person's normal capacity for critical analysis is suspended and an increased level of logical inconsistencies is tolerated. Trans logic opens a hypnotized individual to suggestion. Okay, so there's the idea. So if a person is doing a lot of this trans logic, then you're open to doing and believing what they say. So somebody speaking, what? You sort of know it, but you don't know it, but you're tolerating. What? I don't get it, and you sort of know it. And a lot of, a lot of speakers do this, right? A lot of speakers will do this. And then if you're trans, and you're in this trans kind of thing, and, and they're successful in this, 
then whatever innuendo they give, whatever suggestion they're giving, uh, people will go, will go, will swallow, will follow it, right? Example. Hold on a second. What was the example? Ah. He said like, uh, don't like the tr uh, the trans logic might be something like, uh, don't think that um, that that tree outside the window is made of plastic. Don't don't think. Uh, that that tree is made of plastic. So there's like a little contradiction there. Right? And if somebody hook, is hooked into some kind of contradiction like that, then they recreated or triggered up uh, the confusion, the spellbound the baby had with the mother. He's supposed to love the mother, but the mother's hurting him. There's a contradiction there, but the baby's frozen there. So the trans logic recreates that freezing effect. Then the mother says, okay, baby, conditional love. You want me to be nice to you, do, do what I say? Okay, yes, mother. So this, this, this is like a replay of all this, right? Um, okay. Uh, one article is entitled, To Be and Not To Be, The Concept of Multiple Function and Disassociation. She attempted to reassert her disassociative, disavowal, or trans logic. So to feel or not to feel. Okay, let's, oh, let's take that one out. Okay, next one here. Under the term trans logic, Mr. Orne thought he had finally isolated the non-artifactual kernel of hypnosis. So this is the origin of it, right? There's a, there's a link between hypnosis and this trans, this confusing, contradictory thing. Something's imagined, okay, your fantasies of the baby, Um, trans logic, because of the dis or double think, tr uh, right? Because because of the distortions of reality in in trans relationships, partners magnify events hurtful to them, and paradoxically ignore the sequence and context in which they are created. Living in a world of non sequiturs, the expected sequence of cause and effect events does not follow one another keeps the partners confused and tranced. So maybe we can see this in the, in the, in the so-called infantile puppy love infatuation. So they're in spellbound, right? Somebody in the present, when the baby's laying down near a circuitry with the mother, and it's a problem there. If later on somebody has a psychology similar to your mother, you transfer that neuro, you associate the neuro the unfinished neural networking, the cry for love from, to the person in the present, and you're spellbound, transfixed, love at first sight, infatuation, puppy love, romance, this high romance love, love at first sight, this, okay, it's transference. Okay, so baby had a, had a wiring with the mother, but it's a problematic, unfinished business, uh, Bruce Brody calls it. Somebody in the present has a psychology of your mother, so you're transfixed at that person in the present, So the mother created trans logic. Maybe the partner is confusing and you're spellbound by them. Again, because of the distortions of reality in, in trans relationships, you know, spellbound, falling in love, puppy love relationships, okay, infatuation, etc. Partners magnify events hurtful to them and paradoxically ignore the sequence and context in which they are created. Living in a world of non sequiturs, the expected sequence of cause and effect doesn't follow one another, it keeps partners confused and entranced. In, in so the partner of the present is acting in a similar way to the parent, where the, where the parent created this traumatic confusion, meaning the double thing, meaning the fusion, meaning the painful fusion where the baby didn't get enough love to differentiate. So that's the source point. The baby's one with the mother. All babies need a positive fusion. If there's a problem there, it leads to this trans logic, it leads to double think. So, so non sequiturs or 
there will, so it's not it's not going to be linear. It's the dream world area. So when you, a partner in the present lies to you, confuses you, and blames you, and this does this does all this um, dramatic calorie ups and downs. Uh, you may be transfixed the way the baby was transfixed. So we played the song Love Sick yesterday. That's sort of in that area. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, this is, uh, just bear in mind, this is my first attempt at this topic. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll update this one for sure. Double binding messages are essentially trick communications that, on the surface at least, appear to use normal reasoning. They employ trance logic to confuse and deceive the intended victim into complying with the perpetrator's hidden intentions. The child is not in a, in a position to fight back. Okay. Uh, there's also the effort to give others the pain that you're feeling. So the baby's in a huge double bind, right? He's in pain by the mother, but he must turn to the mother. If he leaves, he won't make it. Turns to the mother, he's in pain by a huge double bind. In the song Love Sick, he said, I, I can't I can't live with you, mother, but I can't live without you. There's that huge double bind. So all the pain around it. Later on, if somebody gives others double binds, they're trying to export, give make others feel the, the pain they repressed that they felt as a child, called projective identification. So people doing these confusing things with others, games people play. They're trying to export uh, their pain, shame with them, that they felt with the mother who gave them the double bind. Again, the, baby's in it. the baby is given a huge double bind. He must turn to the mother. If he, but, to, but when he does so, he's hurt by her, but he's got to go to her anyways. That's a huge double bind. He feels immense pain. That's repressed. Later on, in projective identification, you want someone else to feel the pain that you felt. That's called, export. he calls it here, expo exporting your pain. So in other words, you want to coax others to feel what you're feeling, thinking that you're back in the nursery, mother's feeling what you're feeling, and she'll provide the soothing. Okay, let's go to page two here. The therapist may become intoxicated by a sense of his or her relationship with the client, What? The therapist may become intoxicated by a sense that his or her relationship with the client is protected by a special aura or magic bubble. That's the symbiosis, right? This sense may progress to a feeling of mystical union, so-called love, right? Similar to that experienced in a trance state. On a primary process level, one is attempting to merge with the other. Okay. So here it is again. This double, the, all this uh, games people play, duplicity, uh, trans logic, double thing, projective identification. It's an attempt to merge with the other. It's an attempt to go back to the nursery and merge with the breast mother. Now, if the client induces this in the therapist, the therapist may feel, hey, the client created with me this kind of magic bubble that it's just the two of us. That's what he wants because the client is trying to create a fusion. That's called falling in love. I mean, meaning transference love. Again, the therapist may become intoxicated, right? Spellbound. He may be drunk in love, right? The therapist may become, uh, uh, you know, the honeymoon, something like that, right? By a sense that his relationship with the client is somehow magically protected with a special aura or a magic bubble. That's the symbiosis. The baby and the mother, they have a magic bubble. This sense may progress further to a feeling that they love each other, that there's a mystical union between them, similar to that experienced in a trance state. That's the spellbound. On a primary process level, 
the client is attempting to merge with the therapist. Actually, he was saying that the therapist might do this to the client. If the therapist isn't analyzed, and he didn't mourn, engage in primary mourning himself, he may try to create the spellbound mystical union with the client. So he may try to use the client as a breast to merge with. But usually that's not the case. Usually it's the other way around. The client wants to have this mystical bubble with the therapist. So the client is trying to create, okay? So I love you, you're perfect, now change. Therapist, you, 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 I want you to be the good breast and I want to be one, I want to create this mystical union. That's a, that's a good quote there. Okay, in dreams, okay, primary process mentation, primary process thinking. Objects may be equated with each other, even if they have a, only a trivial feature in common. This phenomenon is reflected in the mechanisms of condensation, replace, uh, displacement, symbolization, or representation of a whole by one of its parts. Okay, so this is, this is a feature of the primary process mentation, the dreams, where the trans logic comes from. That one little thing can represent the whole thing. Okay, like the guy with the Claire's knee film. The woman's knee represents the whole mother. Um, double think. This word evokes the disassociated mentation connect, connected with emotional abuse. Yeah. Okay. So this trans logic, so the cult leader who's confusing you, yeah, he had emotional abuse. He's trying to evoke the, vic the followers' emotional abuse to create this magic bubble, this special aura, yeah. and then he makes suggestions and they follow it. Replaying and tapping into how the baby would do anything for the mother. The baby is trying to save the mother, protect the mother, cure the mother. The baby will do anything for the mother. Mother, what do you want? What do you need? Okay, the baby's desperate to please the mother to get his needs met, so he'll try to discover. So this, this whole area of trans logic and double think is back to this place where the baby's trying to save the mother. So the hypnotist or the, the corrupt self-help guru leader, I mention that because there's an episode, I just saw an episode of Judd for the Defense, right? Uh, Judd for the Defense. There's an episode in there. Uh, hang on a sec, what's that about again? A very good legal uh, comedy, uh, not a comedy, a drama called Judd, uh, Carl Betts is the actor. Uh, he's sort of the Batman of, uh, of lawyers. And his assistant then was sort of the Robin. So they were like a Batman and Robin of lawyers. A uh, very good show called Jump to the Defense. And the episodes are online now. There's no DVD, but it's, it's up on YouTube. Um, so I would watch them just in case they get put down or something. But that's a very good show. There's one, there's one in there where Judd has to face uh, this corrupt uh, uh, cult guru guy, right? What's it about again? And yeah, and in, in the cult guru guy, um, the, the members are all spellbound by him, right? But he, he was corrupt and he was doing hurtful and harmful things. And poor Judd had to, had to defend him uh, because the story was about something outside of his corrupt business. He, he, was, he had to protect him in some other area where he was sort of innocent right? or not at fault. But, but the whole story was to present his whole corrupt scheme, but not confront that, just... Uh, it's like they created a straw man scenario uh, to avoid the bigger issue, but they showed you the bigger issue, but didn't address it, but they showed it to you via focusing on some side issue about his amnesia or something. Um, Okay, next one here. In dissociative, in disassociative disorders, okay, so in trauma there's disassociation, frag, soul fragmentation, you know, so-called isolated islands of self defined by rigidly compartmentalized internal ego boundaries appear to coexist without full integration with one another. 
Okay, for more on this, Philip Bromberg's trilogy on disassociation. So Philip Bromberg is sort of our lead in this topic, disassociation. He's got three books. One is called Standing in the Spaces. So in trauma, there's a self-representation, another self-representation, and there's a gap there. You want to stand in the space and be a bridge. Another one is Awakening the Dreamer, because we're in this trance, this is endorphins, and I'm in, Awaken the Dreamer. Okay, Zaz sings the song. Do you want to love life, or, be, or do you want to just be in this dream kind of thing? And uh, Shadow of the Tsunami, meaning he, he, he thinks emotional trauma is like an emotional tsunami, and the shadow is sort of the after effects of it. So he talks a lot about this isolated self states. It's not separate selves, it's just memories of the self that are like bundled around certain themes, right? Like part self that's loved when he's crying, part self that's abandoned when he needs mother's love. That's, that's what he means, right? In disassociative disorders, uh, isolated, okay, so we can call that a disassociative attachment style, let's say. An insecure attachment style known as the, the disassociative attachment style. Isolated islands of self defined by rigidly compartmentalized internal ego boundaries appear to coexist without full integration with one another. This discrepant experience is maintained by the use of trans logic. It is like a split screen video that displays simultaneous but separate aspects of an even, oops, uh oh. Oh, hang on a sec, I missed something here. Let's see if I can dig it up here. Hang on. Where's that quote? Oh, it's the same one. No, I missed it. Okay. Oh, little, 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 uh, that's, rare. that's quite rare of me to miss, miss a chord like that. Okay, so I'll, fin I'll fix that in the next video. Okay, that's part of it anyway, so we got a part of it there. Let me, let me remember to fix that one here. Okay, the point is, just like some security guard guy has like a screen and he's got like, you know, maybe 10 little mini screens for the 10 different cameras. At the same time, he can watch all the 10 different cameras, right? Yeah. Um, so maybe in a person's mind, it's a little bit like that with trauma. That there's 10 little cells. Yeah. At the same time, we have these 10 little different cells, just like the security guards watching the 10 different screens on the big screen. He says in trauma there can be like a fragmentation like that. That's what he means. It's not separate selves. Don't call them sub-personalities. Don't call them separate ego states. It's confusing because you don't want to do that. You just want to say there's memories in one area, memories in another area. Because we want to link things up. We don't want to encourage the fragmentation of the soul. We don't want to encourage um, the, the separations like that, right? We want to get a coherent self-concept. Don't, don't put a label or a sub-personality. Uh, no, you're just pretending. Um, you're just referring to those memories. You don't want to lose yourself too much like that, right? And you got memories in this area. You got memories in that area. It doesn't mean you have separate personalities. That's, that's, so that's, that's the confusing thing here. So I, I, I agree with those shrinks in the books. We don't want to encourage this idea, always oh, got separate personality, oh, multiple personalities, oh, forget, oh, don't, don't do that. Because you're, 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 you're uh, losing yourself more and more like that. Just say we got painful memories in this area, painful memories in that area. Okay, try to keep a, you're looking for a whole self representation that holds all the memories. So in other words, we don't want the, 
to maintain the, like that image with the security guard and the 10 different screens. We want to move towards where a person watches a movie on a screen and there's just one whole movie with a, you know, things like one story in one movie, not 10 mini movies. We want one movie, something like that, more or less. Trans logic, when false conclusions based on predominantly primary process operations are seamlessly intermixed with ordinary rational thinking in an effort to explain away impossible consistencies. See, here's where people BS people. They take something that's realistic, right? You mix it in with some irrational thing. And that mixing effect gets, allows the liar to explain away or, or not make you face the irrational part. Right? So just say, you, so the, the, the advertiser, let's say, will tell you a lie and they'll tell you something that's true. The blurring of it has the effect where in the end, the person hearing it is, is uh, confused and baffled, so they don't bother. Because this trance logic of the two takes the listener back to the nursery where he experienced pain with the mother, and in the end, he does what the mother says, and he doesn't question it. The baby can't question or know the trauma with the mother, so he doesn't bother. So in, in the advertising, PR, propaganda, all these lying things, they're doing, they're tapping into this. Okay, they'll say something that's true, something that's BS, and then you put it together. Okay, that triggers the babyhood area that they gotta believe the mother and not know the truth that the mother hurt them. No baby can know the truth of the greatest hurt of all. The greatest hurt of all, the greatest hurt of all, says one shrink, quote, mother failed me. No baby can know that. No baby can know that, right? So in the uh, advertising, et cetera, et cetera, they'll, they'll tap into that, they'll do this trans logic thing to get away with a the lie, they'll include the lie and tell you something that's true, circle it up, and that triggers the baby emotionally, oh, okay, and they, and they quote unquote explained away the lie. They got away with the lie. Right? So it's always interesting if you hear a speaker uh, and part of it's true and part of it's what? Uh, that's what they're trying to do. Unknowingly or, no, or knowingly, I don't know. Maybe it's often unknowingly. But that's why today's quotes are interesting. I think despite my uh, imperfect delivery here, I hope there's value in this presentation. And I noticed it calmed down behind me, so I'm feeling a little better. Um, so I kind of worked through it kind of thing. So yeah, this interesting quote, TQ 2685 on trans logic. This is my first time going at it. I've made mistakes in this video. I'll update this later. Um, and I, I think maybe we can learn something from the, the hypnosis community. There's a whole community called, I guess, the people who study hypnosis. There's a whole category of, called uh, trauma studies, right? They just focus on trauma. And there's a whole other category of the hypnosis area. Um, and so far in 1001, when it was the mind, um, I've only done a little bit of quotes from the trauma area. And this is sort of the first time I'm dipping into this hypnosis kind of area here. Understanding, the understanding of different trance states is as diverse as the people who use them. Okay, it can be a parlor trick. Right? Uh, people are... Uh, You know, you go to a circus and the guy gets a volunteer on stage, he hypnotizes them, okay, triggers back that they were traumatized, get them to emotionally transfer the mother they need. So the hypnotist is now the mother they need. Hypnotist says to the guy on the stage, okay, walk around like a chicken or something. He does it to please the mother. He snaps his fingers, comes back, he doesn't remember it. 
That's the, that's the parlor trick. A means to anesthetize without medication. So maybe some uh, dentists can hypnotize a person to imagine that they don't feel pain. I don't know about that. A path to relaxation. Imagine you're sitting by the waterfalls, maybe. A healing tool, a fad, a way of life, a vehicle for propaganda, PR, advertising, etc. So this whole issue of trans states is in a variety of a whole spectrum of areas. That's, that's the introductory point here. Trans logic, a special state of hypnosis. See, so here it is here. This phrase, trans logic, it's a kind of hypnosis. It's not exactly hypnosis. It taps into hypnosis. It taps into trauma. It taps into primary process mentation. It taps into how the baby identifies with the aggressor. And in hypnosis, the victim wants to please the mother, who's now the hypnotist. So this is this whole double think trans logic. We don't really have a phrase for it, other than the phrase trans logic, which, is, which isn't very clear, right? So trans logic is related to primary process thinking. Trans logic, okay, so in primary process thinking, it's the dream world in there. And there's trauma in there for most people. Okay, what's the next one here? Trans logic, okay, a toleration of logical inconsistency characteristic of the hypnotic state. The client's mental dexterities can be thought of as a confabulatory cognitive style an animated by a vivid multisensory fantasy governed by trans logic and sequestered by enormous powers for focus and absor absorption. Such hallucinations, both positive, that is the presence of something that is not there, or negative, that is behaving as if something isn't there, is called trans logic. So the mixture of something that's there and something that's not there. So the typical example is, imagine a, okay, so um, uh, imagine an orange cup. So it's half there, the cup is there, but the orange part is not there. So don't imagine an orange cup. So the moment someone says to you, don't imagine, something that you're seeing. And you're, like the moment someone says to you, so for example, okay, if someone, for maybe, so as I understand it, let's say someone says to you, don't imagine an orange keyboard. That keyboard there, okay, you know what? Don't imagine this keyboard as being orange. And that cup, don't imagine that cup as being orange. That napkin, don't imagine that napkin as being orange. These three things here, don't imagine any of these, any of them as being orange. Orange. They're not orange. Orange. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I don't want to be a hypnotist. I'm just trying to understand trauma. And so the point here is that trans logic, which comes from the trauma studies, uh, So we want to understand trauma. So maybe if we know a little bit about trans logic, uh, maybe we can know more about trauma. So I think, my, you know, my favorite quote here, I think the most helpful one here is this one here. Yeah, I think the best quote here, maybe I struggled with all this just to get to this one here. Okay, this one here. The therapist may become... Okay, there's two of them, yeah. Okay, there's two of them here. So one of them is this one. The therapist may become drunk, intoxicated by a sense that his relationship with the client is protected by a special aura or magic bubble. In this sense may progress to a feeling of 
mystical union or spellbound love, transference love, similar to that experienced in a trance state, like two people falling in love on a honeymoon. On a primary process level, one is attempting to merge with the other. Okay, hang on, hang on. That's tomorrow, right? The one about identification with the aggressor. Okay, so for today's video, I would say that's my favorite one. And I got a feeling for tomorrow's video, my favorite one's gonna be this one here. About identification with the aggressor, where's that one? Oh yeah, here, this one by uh, Lays. Cardiner interpreted trauma as involving the repetition of an infantile mechanism of emotional identification with the mother that entailed such a hypnotic fusion between the self and other as to preclude all possibility of cognition and self-representation. Okay, now this one here. Here, here, here we go. Here's here here uh, between yeah between today's video and tomorrow's video I got a feeling this is this is the key one here. Hypnosis was the means by which Charcot. So apparently Freud started his career by studying. He he flew to France or something to study with Mr. Charcot. So, so Charcot was before Freud, right? Hypnosis was the means by which Charcot legitimated the concept of trauma, right? So there is trauma. In other words, we identify that there is such a thing as trauma by proposing that the client in pain, let's say, okay, that he, that he, um, that the, that the person who's unhappy, that this is a reproduction of the trauma in the past called repetition compulsion. What is less well understood is that hypnosis was not just an instrument of research and hopefully treatment. See, see that, that's, that's why everyone gives up on it. You can't do it. It doesn't work. You can't heal somebody without their conscious participation of it. But long ago, they thought maybe they can. Well, you got repressed memories. Well, how are we gonna to get to those repressed memories? They're repressed for a reason. They only come up when you're conscious. If you bypass the consciousness, that's called spiritual bypassing. You're going against your soul. Your wounded inner child of the past is gonna be regressed to even a more regressed place. Who was it? Marion Woodland says, if the ego is so traumatized, when the person dreams, they might, they might not even be themselves in the dream. They might be like a small animal. She says one client dreamt they were a golf ball. Like that's how damaged um, the ego is in trauma. That they're, even, they're not even themselves in the dream. There's something more regressed to a more primal identification. Maybe their pet or something, or maybe even a, in a, something inanimate. That's why in one motif of missing fairy tales is when something, a small animal, morphs into a bigger animal, right? Um, I think uh, Robert Bly tells the story of uh, the duck zooped into a bigger, like a, a dog, and the dog whooped into a deer, and the deer whooped into a, a gorilla, and the whooped, and finally got a per, then finally got the king or the you know prince of the person. So the, in the healing, the self concept uh, got bigger, like more and more close to the human realm. So in a dream, somebody might dream that they're a golf ball, she said. Right? And then when you're healing, okay, now you're, now you're uh, whatever you saw as a child, whatever animal you, you related to as a child. And you might feel like you're that. And then you went to the zoo as a child. Okay, and now you're a horse in the dream. And then later, okay, now you're... Now you're a person finally. So as you see, that, that, that's uh, so. Marion Woodman, it's on YouTube. Uh, the lectures, something chrysalis. That lecture about the chrysalis. She mentions it in that video there. 
I don't think I have I don't think I have that quote here in this collection. Yeah, maybe we'll add it on. Okay, again, hypnosis was the means by which Charot legitimated the concept of trauma by proposing that the hysterical crisis that he suggestively induced in his patients were reproductions of traumatic scenes. So if somebody hypnotizes you, you've reproduced the traumatic scene. If somebody hypnotizes you, you reproduced the traumatic spellbound scenario with the mother. Now when the baby's spellbound with the mother, he's gonna do what the mother says. So the, so the hypnotist says, oh, walk around the room, but don't see the chair. So they walk around the room and they walk around the chair, not knowing, um, believing that there's no chair. But another part of them, it has a self-survival instinct, so he, he doesn't hit the chair. So there's a deeper drive uh, for his survival. He's not gonna hit the chair. See, so the, the, the hypnotist said to the person, um, there's no chair, walk around the room. So if he really believed there was no chair, he would hit the chair. But, some, but there's a deeper part of him, a more organic part of him, that says, no, no, there's a chair there, I'm not gonna walk around, but I won't believe it. So he walks around the chair to protect himself. Right? So that's good because that's, that's, that's very helpful because we don't want it to be, the, nobody wants it to be the case if somebody hypnotizes somebody and they tell them to do something and they'll do it because the guy suggested it. There's something deeper, there's something more human that wouldn't do what the mother said, right? As an adult. But the baby's trying to please the mother. See, that's the whole, okay? Again, hypnosis was the means by which Charot legitimated the concept of trauma by proposing that the hysterical crisis that he suggestively induced in his patients were reproductions of traumatic scenes. What is less well understood is that hypnosis was, was not just an instrument of research and treatment, but played a major theoretical role in the conceptualization of trauma. Because this is because the tendency of hypnotized persons to imitate or repeat whatever they were told to say or do provided a basic model for the traumatic experience. Trauma was defined as a situation of disassociation or absence from the self in which the victim unconsciously identified with the aggressor. Right? So there, there's the key again. The baby identifies with the aggressor. He's now the mother. The hypnotist is the mother. He's the mother. He's the hypnotist. He believes what the hypnotist says. So if the propaganda guy says, oh, think this, I want you to do this, they think that's, they have those thoughts. Huh? So in other words, the more traumatized a person is, the more, the more uh, they're, uh, the more uh, persuaded they are by the persuasion of those who give people uh, trans logic. Or we can, or, but awareness of all this, now you can notice him. So, okay, if you're listening to someone giving all this confusing double, double speak, okay, that, that they're, they're engaging in trans logic, you're spellbound. And then when they suggest something or imply something, you, you accept it as yours kind of thing. So you believe what they're, what they finally are going to say. Now, if, if these people are doing it and they're not aware of it, it's because they want others to be the good breast so they can merge and create a special aura. What do you call it again? Um, the magic bubble between them. Right? Because the person doing it is looking for the good breast. So, trans logic, double thing, games, people play, duplicity, lies, rhetoric, propaganda, PR, advertising, all these tricky things. You're looking for the good breast. Everything is either love or a cry for love. So in conclusion, trans logic is a cry for love. But nobody in the present can be the breast in the past. But it's a cry for love. It's their original cry for love in the nursery, still being played in the present. Okay? Again, Greenberg, quote, Shrink said to the guy, you have trouble living in the present. So you're dwelling in the past because you never got your needs met. You never lived it. You never 
got satisfied. So you're replaying it. So trans logic in the present is the baby crying for, for love, for mother's love. Put it that way, right? Everything is love or a cry for love. If the baby's loved, he expresses his true self, he enjoys the present, he makes sense. Generative, normal, normal adult personality, warm, affectionate, caring, helpful, uh, wishing well for others. When they say hello, it means I, I wish you health and wholeness. Uh, if somebody doesn't have whole object relations with a psychological birth, again, man's main task is to give psychological birth to himself if he didn't get it naturally by the age of three with a secure attachment style, yeah? then that's called the hero's journey of midlife, the second journey of midlife. So roughly at 40, roughly at the age of 40, a lot of people, it kicks in for a lot of people, something's missing, sleepwalking for life, spell, okay, um, feeling that life is on hold, feeling unreal, all these expressions, right? And then, then they go on the second journey of midlife. So a good place to start is the comic psychoanalysis. Okay, because that's a very good introduction to psychoanalysis, the comic. Um, it's, it was originally put out in 1955, uh, but three years ago it, it got digitized. Uh, Dark Horse Publishing, um, it's well worth whatever the cost is. Um, only four issues were put out in 55. now it's digitized. So one can get a crash course in psychoanalysis taught through comics, can you believe it? It's the best introduction to psychoanalysis, that comic. Um, they, they do 12 therapy sessions um, uh, total, uh, the, the complete run, using three uh, clients. Freddy is one of them. Mark is another one. He, he, he's the, the womanizer, the emotion, the, um, the overeater, the woman, I, he's the toxic masculine character, right? That's the third one, yeah. Oh, El, Ellen, Ellen is the third one, right? So, Freddie, Ellen, and Mark, those three, yeah. Emotional eating. Speaking about emotional eating, emotional eating can be understood as a form of regression, yeah. So emotional eating is a kind of trans logic, right? There's your food. Is it mother's love in the nursery? No, but it's food. There's a, there's, there's a trans logic right there. You see a cookie, you're not physically hungry, you don't need the food, but there's food and there's love. No, the cookie's not love from the mother. There's a trans logic, you're already spellbound, right? You're already hypnotized. So you hypnotize with a cookie. The people selling the cookies says, here, eat these cookies. You'll be loved. So you buy the cookies, or you, or you see the cookies. <laughs> Hang on a sec, let me, let me correct this. When you see the cookie, a part of you knows it's food, that's realistic. Another part of you thinks it's the love that you needed in the nursery. So it's irrational, that's the irrational part. The rational part is, well, it's food. So you blur in the two. The rational part, that it's food. The irrational part is that it's gonna be mother's love from the nursery. Now, because you blur it up like that, it explains away, or it squelches, the irrational part. And you think, oh, it's food. Well, it's okay, then you eat the cookie. Yeah, something like that, right? Gosh, I'd love to I would love to interview somebody who's an expert in this area. Again, this is my first go at this topic. Whenever I begin a new topic, I, it's really kind of all over the place. So instead of 30% of what you heard is wrong, it's going to be more like maybe 70%. I'd be thrilled if only 30% was correct. <laughs> So that's why the quotes are posted below, you know, one, one can skip my, all of my confused commentary and, and, read my, and read the quotes directly themselves. 
This is typical of me. When I, I might present a quote, I'll be confused, I'll think about it, and later on when I talk about it, it'll be, I think it'll be better. I've had that happen numerous times. So that's, so yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, re, we'll uh, redo these um, quotes tomorrow, some of these quotes tomorrow. So I think we did it here for today, right? The client's mental dexterities can be thought of as a confla confabulatory cognitive style, animated by vivid, okay, dream world, multisensory fantasy, your wishes, your unconscious fantasies, governed by trance logic and sequestered by enormous amounts, enormous powers for focus and absorption. So the mind has deep, wishful fantasies. Right? And in the dreams, there's wish fulfillment. You have the fantasy that you need something. And it's multi-sensory, it's vivid. Okay, that's part of it, right? Double think. This word evokes disassociated mentation connected with emotional abuse. Yeah. See, all this double think, right? Mother, child, blur it up, double think. Part of it's the mother, part of it's the self. Self thinks it's the mother, the mother thinks it's the self. It's all this confused. It's Alice in Wonderland. It's mad in there. That's trauma. If the child isn't traumatized, his speaking will be kind of reasonable and measured and honest on track. It'll acknowledge what it doesn't know, maybe, uh, and it's not gonna. It's not gonna be used to slip in something irrational, you know. Yeah, this magic bubble one's a good one. Yeah. So, so in, in, in the Spellbound, yesterday's song, The Spellbound by Rick Santos, you see somebody and you got this magic bubble. Wow. That means one person wants, wants the emotionality of the nursery to be satisfied. Attempting to merge with the other. Trans logic, as if you were trying to understand the logic of a dream. Okay. Now, in the dreams, we're trying to heal, we're trying to process trauma. Trans logic, perceptions are fused in a manner that ignores everyday logic, like a drama which wins. Like when you watch a movie, okay, there's this, a suspension of disbelief. Thoughts have free reign, unchecked by contradiction and, and critical reflection. So just like we're willing to believe the fantasy story on the show, trans logic has that kind of, I'm willing to believe the lies, like we're willing to believe the story. Similar, yeah, maybe not the best example that one though. Paradoxical doublespeak, such as psychotic wisdom. That's a good, let's change it that, psychotic wisdom. What? Wisdom, psychotic. Already, you're in a trance. And then when a person's in a trance, whatever the hypnotist says, the other person might think it's their thoughts, or the, because it triggers the original identification with the aggressor with trauma, where the baby becomes the mother. Yeah, so trans logic is sort of linked with hypnosis and trauma. So it's all linked up together, right? Primary process mentation, trauma, hypnosis, trans logic, disassociation, identification with the aggressor. This is all sort of linked up, right? 
Okay, so living in a world of non sequitur, so there's no, there's no cause and effect, there's no time, there's no linear time, okay, there's no time, so something happened, you don't, you don't think about the cause of it, so there's something, well, something caused that, right? So think about, um, we had a quote about uh, the borderline, the BPD pattern, where the person would say something in a minute, 10 minutes later, they'd say something else and forget that the thing that, so they, they would say something, let's say at one o'clock and believe it in full, that's there. And then at two o'clock, they would say a different thing from a different self-concept and forget and ignore and believe it didn't exist because of the difference, remember the different screens kind of thing. So the person with the BPD pattern doesn't care about cause and effect. You said that an hour ago. You really believe that. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, well, you know, and they brush it off. Well, well, now they're saying this. And that's that's their truth, so-called, you call postmodernism, you call it, right? That means the trauma of not making links. So we, we want to make links. We want to weave a basket. We want to weave a basket. Just watch it pass by.
we doing here? Yeah. Yeah, today's a shorter video. Okay. That's okay. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, uh, I've been very anxious during this video. Challenging topic. Um, some, just some distractions around me. Uh, the caffeine. Plus the triggering. I notice sometimes you read this material, you do feel a little triggered up by some of it. Right? It does open up some things. Um, this is a deep. This is a deep um, issue here. This topic, because you're we're talking about trauma, right? Whenever we post quotes about trauma, that's always the hardest material to get into. It's even more difficult than yesterday's topic. John Sanford's talking about, right? I would say the most emotionally triggering material is when we talk about trauma, right? Like, like this, type of, this type of talk. See, um, you'll notice trans logic uh, most pronouncedly, I think, uh, um, with, with the sting of personality patterns. Um, uh, they really want to get away with their, uh, um, with their irrational um, s side of them. So they uh, will, will, they're considered the most hypnotic, I think. The, the sting of personality patterns are probably way more hypnotic uh, than the clingers or the healthy types, right? Is that right? People with the narcissistic personality patterns, I think they're going to be pretty good in this area, right? The narcissistic personality patterns. Because part of the narcissistic personality pattern is there. One theory about a lot of this charm is that the baby is really, his antenna is really there, one with the mother. So they can read others very well because they become the aggressive mother. They, they've learned the skill. Mother, what does the mother want? Mother wants this, mother wants that. So they, they identified with the aggressor. And they have that skill. So they can be the aggressor, use the skill of the baby, but act like the aggressor, charm, hypnotize others as if they're the baby trying to understand the mother, identify with the aggressor. See, they can flip around like that, right? They can use the skill of the baby with the aggressive mo motive of the mother. See, that, that's it gets also trans logic. Trans logic is partly the emotionality of the baby, okay? And um, the reality that the baby needs mother's love, but the mother's hurting him, it's all blurred up like this, right? Double think, double speak. Double talk, focus, focus, double focus. That's all a sign of trauma, right? Somebody wants to con sell you something, convince you of something. Usually it's trans logic, right? Let's think about an advertisement. We did one advertisement maybe a while ago, it was about uh, the, the muffler shop. At this muffler shop, you're a somebody. What? I have a whole identity if I buy a muffler at your shop? So the emotionality, that's irrational, right? How, how can buying a product for your car give you a, a personal identity? Now, of course, the reasonable side is, well, what they mean is we'll treat you nicely, or we'll, we'll treat you like, we'll respect you as a person. But the emotional side of you goes, oh, there's an unconscious appeal that the baby wanted to be a somebody. The baby wanted to be a person. Or will make you feel important. Uh, His Majesty the baby one. So there's a kind of a blurring, right? There's a kind of a blurring. So, so that slogan, that company that made that slogan increased their sales they, they tripled their sales like a, almost instantly once they put out that slogan. At this muffler shop, you're a somebody. So we posted that quote about two years ago, yeah. 
two and a half years ago. Yeah, oh my god, it's the three years now. This channel is three years and one day old. Yeah? <laughs> the very first quote posted here, TQ number one, the very first quote was the travails of the traveler. The travails of the traveler reveal the traveler to himself. I thought that kind of summarizes the hero's journey, huh? The travails of the traveler reveal the traveler to himself. So we're learning about ourselves, know thyself, yeah, and so on. Maybe, um, maybe I'll close up with our theme song here. Hold on a second. Let's close up with our theme song. Our theme song is uh, Ketje Epstein's German cover of Windmills of the Mind. Thanks very much. This has been TQ2685. We'll wrap it up here with our theme song. some more windmills of the mind in the next video. 
Until then, I'll see you. Thanks. Oh yeah, if uh, anybody would like a copy of 1001 Windmills of the Mind, 10,000 advanced self-help quotes, uh, the link is below.